So today, I want to talk to you about paradox. I roam around a good bit in whatever quantum physics has to say along the way, and one of the deepest underlying dynamics is that we live in a universe of paradox. Rather than our world and reality being either or, it turns out it's both and. For example, we were just spending a little time in timelessness, just being. That's a very real experience, if you did touch into it. The timeless moment doesn't have anything starting or stopping it. It just is. So past, present, and future just are what they are. And then here we are with minutes passing. Time is moving along. That's true, too. Our outer world that we live in where we've got, we've got days, we've got weeks, we've got form, that's all real, and there's also timeless stillness that isn't anything but being. So I want to talk a little about how we get in habits of the either-or thinking. And one of the things that we forget is there's only one source, that there is only one life living everything that is. Our either-or mind makes things that are good and bad, right and wrong, which is true. And we don't always remember that even when we feel something is wrong, we're engaging the same life that lives us. Now, I want to make sure to say as a caveat here, I'm not saying ever to accept things that aren't right for your life and your world. We, we are wired to act, to respond, to change things if we don't like how they are, they are. So that's not what I'm suggesting. However, it can be a little mind-bending when we actually remember that we are never encountering an other. We may not like the way that Source dresses up at different times, but we are still engaging the one life that lives all of us. So, t for a moment, bring to mind something you really don't like, something you feel is distasteful. For a lot of people, that's insects or, you know, just think of the thing that makes you go, ew, or ugh, I don't want anything to do with that. Because we all hold these either-ors. There's nobody around <clears throat> who doesn't have their list of, ugh, yuck, don't come near me with that. So bring it to mind, kind of let your body go, mm, you know, the, the experience that we have when we're around something. We even might even think it shouldn't be here. Like, if, if that all went away, life would be fine. <clears throat> so now, what if, when you're looking at that, you remember that that is the sacred in form. Everything, everything, everything is the sacred in form. So notice what happens internally if you're looking at that thing you really don't like and you wish it weren't even on the planet and touch into that is an expression of the sacred. Because there's nothing anywhere that isn't an embodiment of the sacred in some form or another. And so just take a moment to feel into how your experience might be if you moved through the world, even when you disagree with something, remembering that its essential being is the sacred. I don't personally understand why life has to express in all these ways that I don't like, but that's, who cares? <laughs> um, but if we, so it's sort of a mind game <clears throat> of how do we find that place in our hearts 
that can acknowledge, okay, I don't like this, but I do understand it's the sacred in form. It's not some other thing that shouldn't be here. And I don't know if you all are running into this, but every single spiritual resource I listen to or watch on YouTube, inevitably, whoever's speaking comes back to the importance for all of us to remember that the most healing, really important frequency that we can resonate with is love, in universal love kinds of terms. That the more we can radiate love in the world, the more we're adding at least the recognition that there is nothing outside this loving source. So just notice, how does your brain feel when it dances with the idea that paradox insists that the sacred is here and things we don't like are the sacred in form? That that, that source is taking a shape we absolutely don't agree with and don't want to engage. And yet it's still part of the one life that's living everything. I personally think oneness is the hardest thing at times to hold on to. When I'm busy in my brain thinking, oh, I really can't stand that that is happening, I can continue not to be able to stand that's happening, but I task myself to remember, and that is kin in the sense of source. One of the things, I, I have this very odd, lifelong relationship with insects. I don't know why. I just have many different experiences with them. And in my apartment, living with cats, I can't blame the cats, but their insects of an interesting variety have made their way into my apartment. <laughs> and I, they aren't insects you can walk outside. There's nowhere to take them. Uh, when, I get, when I gave up my office during COVID, I apparently brought home carpet beetles. I didn't know that they were in my office, but apparently when I brought stuff home, and because of the cats, I can't use insecticides, so I have to get creative when I have bugs around. And I became a vacuuming maniac. I mean, I just vacuumed all the time, all the time. They have now thank goodness, gone. But then shortly after I started to get that under control, I opened a drawer in the kitchen and there were these teeny weeny adorable little beetles. <laughs> I don't know what they came in. I'm probably a bag of cat food of some kind. But what I, I made myself do a practice since there were hundreds of them. Over time, probably thousands. But I found if I did that, I could get them <laughs> just by doing... <laughs> But each time I put them either down the toilet or down the sink, I made myself recognize that I was ending the life of an earthkin, of a brother or a sister, and an expression of the sacred. I was taking away its physical form. Now, after months of this, I've also gotten on top of those. But there's a new little critter that showed up near the litter boxes. I have no idea what it is, but I'm sure I'll get to know it over time. But to me, all of these are earthkin. They are my relatives. They are part of Earth's sacred expression. And they have every right to be here the same as I'm here. They just can't live in my apartment, <laughs> right? Is the only thing, because they just, they, they, multiply so quickly. It's just amazing to me what insects can do, the intelligence of insects. But it's how do we go into life remembering everything on this planet is a relative and everything we encounter is the sacred having taken up that body and that expression. I have found it an interesting practice that keeps me not taking life for granted, that I, I know when I am taking a life, I'm taking a life. That, and it doesn't become a drama, it's just the recognition that this is the sacred in form, and I'm engaging it in that way. Um, 
one of the other things I wanted, I, I have notes because I had so much I wanted to say and I had to boil it down. Um, one of the things I've also done as a practice, and I learned this through an organization called Lorien that was founded by David Spangler, who's someone who's been around forever. And one of the things David taught us to do was to remember that every place, indoors or outdoors, that every place we enter has a spirit of place. For example, when I go into Central Park, I'm always aware that the spirit of the park is there. Now, I'm kind of lax about this, but what I do when I'm being aware is I ask the park if I can come into it. Is it all right for me to be here this day? But one of the things that David has done so much teaching about is when you go into a building to remember that this is sacred. It's still all the sacred expressing. So what happens if you attune to the spirit of that place? So if I'm at a vet's office or I'm at a medical appointment or something like that, I always tune in. Now, I'm not psychic the way my grandmother was, so I don't perceive what, what's responding, but I always tune in to the spirit of, let's say, the vet's office, thanking it for embodying a space where healing is happening and sharing my gratitude that that particular place is there filled with those particular people. When you walk into, let's say, that you feel when you walk in here, you can feel the tone and quality of the space. In my world, there's an embodying spirit of this that holds those qualities. Think about when you go to um, a store. What happens if you, as you enter the store, feel into the qualities of that place and offer a blessing? Offering blessings is a really nifty practice to do all the time. Actually, David Spangler has a, um, a, just a process that I really like. He calls it the touch of love. And if you remember that our heart spaces are constantly filled with universal love, they can't run out. He imagines love flowing down his arm so that everything he touches gets touched by the frequency of love. He doesn't have to be conscious of it every minute, but he sets that intention so that he's constantly sharing blessings as he goes through his world. And it, sometimes when I'm thinking about it, I think, what if a really large critical mass of people went through the world blessing everything? What would that do to our collective frequency? It's one way to express love as we go through the world. It also asks us to remember we're engaging living presence in every moment. Even this, as I'm leaning on this, I'm aware there's life here, even though we think of it as plastic. It's still earth-made, and it's got presence. Some. Some of these podiums are not so neat to lean on. This one happens to be really friendly. <laughs> it feels quite supportive and friendly, but that's not always the case. <laughs> Things have different qualities. Um, so uh, let me read you. I, uh, there's, there's a quote from David Abram, who's kind of an ecological guy, that I want to share with you, but also to add to this idea of connecting with the life of spirit that's everywhere, when you are in a garden, or you're by a river, or a lake, or the ocean, or a mountain, it, it, just play with the idea, what if it's true that everything I encounter is, an, is embodied by a spirit, and that Every single thing I encounter is the sacred moving in the world. 
How would we treat nature if we understood it was an embodiment of the sacred, the same as the sacred that lives us? And I think that part of what happens is when we can go around remembering we are related to absolutely everything, there's not a moment we're not, then what if we could be more in a conscious communion with the world around us? I had a really weird experience, weird, not even so weird in my world, but weird, <laughs> in a class I was in where we were asked to choose an object, any object, and find out what it had to share with us. So I have this absolutely beautiful um, light maple credenza that I brought from my office, probably with the carpet beetles when I got home. But it's, it's just been with me for so many years. We've been partnering in this healing work. So I thought, oh, I'll just tune in on the credenza, what the heck. Well, it shocked me. Some little being hopped out of it and said, oh, we're so, I'm so glad you're paying attention. We're from Maine. And they were showing me all the trees from which this credenza was made. And I thought, well, that ramps up the idea that everything's alive. That really, that really gave me a deeper sense and then I ran across something like David A Abrams' quote. So let me, let me read this to you because I just, I was enchanted by this. He says, few people today, when they're cycling past a strand of oaks, sense that those trees are sensing them. We don't feel the breeze gusting around us as a sensitive and sentient presence. And upon arriving at our place of work and settling down to the day's tasks, we don't concern ourselves that the chairs we sit in register our presence or that the walls of the room are affected by our actions. So I'll tell you a, a, a story that may sound a little fantastical, but when I gave up my office, I had been there for 33 years, and I had always, every day, entered the office, rung the Tibetan singing bowl to say good morning, we're opening the space. I always thanked the office for being a healing partner with what went on there, and then I would ring the bowl in the evening. So we had a long, many, many year experience. And the last day before I was gonna hand in the keys, it was empty, and I said to it, I took some Palo Santo, I was doing a kind of a releasing ceremony so that it could be free for the next person who would come. And I said, I'm asking you, I'm talking to the office, I'm asking you to release our time together because I want you to really be clear of everything that has been taken in over these 33 years. I didn't expect a response, actually. I was just doing my thing. All of a sudden, I was standing in the main consulting room. All of a sudden, coming from the floor and the walls were 33 years of impressions of the people who had walked through that office. And I thought, it's doing it. The walls are releasing and the floor is releasing. And that deepened my awareness that everything is aware. That's why I liked this quotation so much, that he's pointing out we're not walking around in a dead universe. We're, but here's the thing, and here's where the paradox comes in. Our perceptions say, nah, nah, that, that couldn't actually be happening. But we want to keep moving ourselves toward a both-and perspective, where Yes, it's true that in this dimension, things are not as, well, they are in some cultures. Our culture does, it teaches us a linear kind of more physical orientation. But to be aware that there are things that seem fantastic that are actually real and are with us all the time. So I really, I want to invite you just to imagine moving through your days, knowing or pretending or imagining that every single thing you encounter is alive in its own way. 
and is conscious in its own way. Not the same as a human consciousness, but that the sacred is living in and expressing through everything, even every chair in this room, is not an inert, unaware piece of stuff. Even that, even the carpet I'm standing on, everything is, has its own kind of sentiency. And to just notice what that does to your quality of life when you realize we are encountering our earth relations in every moment and that the sacred is always looking back at us. With the caveat, we, that doesn't mean going along with things we don't agree with that we have the right to respond, but first to remember it's all the sacred. There is nothing, like right now, as we're looking at each other, we are the sacred looking at itself in every moment with every single one of us. This whole room is the sacred taking in our presence and holding it for us in the qualities and tone that all of you who have been loving this space have been building into it. So that's about all I had to share for this time. But let me ask you just to take one moment to drop inside. Just one moment to drop inside. And to just let yourself resonate with the fact that we are never ever for the tiniest moment alone. That we are in relationship in every single moment with the world around us, with our environment, and with all the life forms we encounter every day. And so it is.